Hi, my name is Tony Underwood. Come and join me on the Final Whistle podcast. All things from Cure to Gyoza to Best Swimmer in the World. Hello and welcome back to the Final Whistle, brought to you by the Rugby Connection podcast. Well, what a guest we have for you today. He is infamous for playing alongside his brother for England in the 90s. He tore up for Leicester. He won a premiership with Newcastle. Grand Slam winner in 95. We won't talk about what happened later that year in 95, though. And he was also part of the 1997 Lions Tour. It's Tony Underwood. Tony, thank you so much for coming on. How are you getting on? Very, I'm excellent. Thank you. Feel better for that little intro, you know. No one bigs me up these days, so there you go. But uh, my children don't anyway. <laughs> well, I'll I'll hype you up. I'll make I'll make up for it then. No, very kind. Thank you very much. Long time ago, but very very privileged to have done those things. So thank you very much. You're very welcome. And I think you're actually our first Leicester type, our our first Newcastle Falcon, first Premiership winner from that time. Yeah, you're our first. You're our first nineties based player as well. Yeah. There's 90s play. We, we're, yeah. we're delving into the into the the, the archives now. Yeah, yeah, no, telly and, uh, yeah. We didn't wear any of these sort of tight looking shirts. We had all those baggy ones, and you had the baggy cotton ones. Yeah, they yeah, now so. cost a fortune. The, yeah. <laughs> yeah, even if it wasn't the good teams, they're still ridiculously priced for some reason, yeah. just because yeah. throw the word vintage in front of it. We, yeah, well, we had the diehard fans. They were brilliant. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> First question that we ask all our guests this, what actually got you into rugby in the first place, Tony? Oh, school. I had to. No choice. Elder brother played lots of rugby. Two elder brothers that played rugby. Gary, who was the really talented one, and then Rory, obviously, the elder one, sort of uh, ploughing the fields as he was. So I had no choice. I came into the first year of school. I was up in Barnet Castle, County Durham, North Yorkshire sort of area. And... Um, yeah, so I had no choice. Was in the round ball game until then, and uh, don't think I was very skillful, but very quick. <laughs> but uh, that could get you so far at that stage, anyway. Uh, could could take me quite a long way, I think, just being quick on a football pitch. But anyway, um, but yeah, got into first year at rugby. Uh, sorry, at Barnet Castle, and then yeah, rugby was kind of uh, no choice. Off you go. <laughs> I love that. Were you always on the wing? When you played rugby, or did yeah, you? yeah, I can't, I can't speak for anything else. So, um, I didn't. Um, uh, I might have played centre a couple of times, might play full back a couple of times, but you know, yeah, my my right. my variety was left or right wing. Uh, what I'd like to right. say though, as much as they put that number on my back, I was get, I got myself around the pitch a little bit to try and get involved. That was my game. So, yeah. But now you you did mention your brother. Well, you mentioned Rory. What was it like playing alongside your brother? Because not many brothers get to play for their country, let alone together, so simultaneously. So what was that like? Well, we had the Hastings at the time, obviously from your neck of the woods, so Gavin and Scott. So, um, um, you know, there's a few others actually, but um, um, no, it was uh, well, great. I mean, an aspect of... There was, an, there was an age differential. So to be honest, there was an extent of just when you go into any team, there's, I wouldn't call them cliques, but there was more an aspect of your, your tendency was to hang out with people more your age or who you'd be around or who you knew a bit better. So by the time I came in the England team, that team is pretty settled. You know, Will, Will had been in charge, for, well, been captaining for a while. Jeff Cook had been in charge of that sort of group and had been bringing them forward. And there was kind of a... A, a real core of players at that stage. And then my age group was starting to come through, you know, uh, uh, sort of early 90s. Um, and um, so there's there's a six-year age gap. So, you know, it was, he was always my elder brother and always looked at him and respect for him. And it was just more a respect for as an elder statesman in the, well, statesman, I couldn't call him that at that age, but maybe it was. Uh, but, um, but, you know, he, there was the elder sort of, Sort of experienced group in the squad that you kind of looked up to and he just happened to be my brother as well so but uh yeah a comforting aspect to a few familiar faces and i guess because i'd been 
you know, he'd been in the squad for that while I kind of knew some of the players as a result of that. And that helped rather than just being everyone's strangers. Good. I love that. Who was the most surprising player in the squad that was very welcoming that you didn't expect to be? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Um, well, as it happened, because of the way sort of rooming worked, you went 15 with 14. Uh, and it was it was John Webb at the time and then Mike Cat, uh, Simon Hodgkinson, sorry, those sort of names. But for some reason, I was the 14 coming in, but Rory tended to end up with the fullback quite a bit. I ended up with uh, Jerry Guskett uh, quite a bit. So probably if you would talk about the most... Well, not surprising, but I'd probably have the bit of bit of uh, trepidation about meeting and what's Jerry going to be like. Uh, but he was very welcoming and um, uh, and you know took me under his wing to a certain extent. And you know, the guy looked up to everyone would looked up to in that sort of era uh, in terms of the talent, but also for the character he was. So yeah, to be roomed with him was quite quite a nerve wracking experience. But uh, no, got on with, really nicely with Jerry and. Um, uh, and I think one of those things sort of evolving from becoming established in the team to becoming sort of in within the squad and getting that validation from someone like Jerry was always something I look back on and so be very proud about. Yeah, as you should be, rightfully so. I love that. Thank you. Um, was there any pressure on you when you first got into the squad just because of who your brother is? No, I, no. No, I don't think there was anything attached to being Rory's brother. It was more attached to, you know, any pressure I would have felt was, you know, me who I was, you know, coming into the team, proving myself and getting yourself in there, just like any other player in that sort of uh, coming into that arena. So, um, yeah, no, I just, um, it, as I said, Rory's elder brother, I don't think any expectation apart from that. Uh, probably more so from the earlier age groups when you're coming in, you know, sort of much more, you were kind of maybe looked at because you were Rory's brother. Now, oh, what's he going to be like? But by the time I got to that stage, it was more, you know, you're proving yourself in other words. You're, 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 you know, you're being seen anyway. So, uh, so, so you didn't have to sort of, you, you had to prove yourself in your own merit to get into that. So I, I didn't get into the England squad because I was Rory's brother, put it that way. Well, he said, I don't know, maybe you need to speak to Jeff Cook and Will Carling. That's but, true. Uh, I, I don't think so. <laughs> the, only, the only reason I ask is because obviously nowadays you've got a lot of players, children getting into the game. For example, like Ad, like you mentioned the Hastings. Obviously, Adam uh, plays professionally. Yeah. And yeah. there's always that, oh, is he anything like his dad? No. There'll be comparisons, but I don't think, you know, so, so it'll more raise an interest about whether you look at a person. But then... Then, then it goes on to the next stage, which is, are you going to select them for anything? Is he, is he any good? Uh, so yeah, you're absolutely right. I'm of the, I'm of the vintage where all these bloody children are coming through, uh, the De Glanvilles, Partons, Ajomos, and I'm going to miss out bunches. Brackens. Um, there's a Logan out there playing as well, I believe, isn't it? But I, yes, I read yes. a lovely tweet the other day that poor Kenny was. I think Kieran Bracken's son was playing and Kenny's Kenny and Gabby Logan's son was playing. It's like, who's Kenny going to be, but for England under 18s or something. So uh, is Kenny going to be singing the national anthem before the game? But uh, <laughs> I don't think he did. Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> um, talk to us about the legend that we sadly lost last year, Doddy Weir, because I know you played with him on the Lions tour. You were with him at Newcastle. Just what was what was it like being around him on a on a daily basis? Uh, well, just to add to that, is it? Can I swear on you? Yeah, uh, of course. Yeah, it was a shit year for us basically because um, you know that Doddy was the third of three uh, playing players' losses. We probably lost a few others, but uh, uh, as sort of fans and sort of people associated with the club at Newcastle, but we lost um, Inga Twigamala and Steve Black. Uh, last year as well so Doddy was just the sort of cap of just a really really sad year I, I suppose the aspect with Doddy was it wasn't a surprise uh, mm -hmm. like Blackie and, 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 and Inga but no lot no you know 
doesn't mean it sort of takes it away. There's just sort of significance of losing him when we did because because he was just putting up such an amazing fight and battle. And that's what Doddy was. You know, he battled everything. The way he took, the way he confronted any challenge was with humor, a smile on his face, adopted the challenge and just got on with it. And so, you know, not not long after sort of getting to know him at the Falcons, we were down in South Africa with the Lions that tour. And his tour was really cruelly ended because of um uh Bosman, I think his name was sort of stamping on his uh on it on the side of a ruck, just stomped on his leg and twisted his uh, knee ligaments and so he a cruel end to the tour for him but again you know within a few hours of basically getting told this tour was ended how do I face this challenge and how do I support everyone else while I'm here uh to to the mission ahead and just looking forward with positivity and optimism I saw it to them then and he definitely saw it and, and the whole world saw it with him uh with how he took on the challenge of um MND so uh uh just um just an amazing amazing man uh and, and just you know sort of you couldn't look at anyone else as just being a great sort of role model for how to take on a challenge and do it you know and i say i say this because it's easy so sort of when you when you took at challenges but it was obviously when you look at sort of success and but how you how you sort of almost sort of approach these things the same way with positivity and optimism with a smile on his face and just so inclusive of everyone, you know, everyone, any Mandaka child, whoever you were, because my back to my first introduction to Doddy was, you know, having played against them a few times, was up at was up at Newcastle when I signed for the Falcons. They invited Gary and uh, Gary Armstrong and Doddy Weir to come along just to have a look at what was going on at the Falcons. But they invited them to St James's when I was doing a signing ceremony. I thought they were signing. Everyone else thought they were signing, but they weren't. So, um, but he was meeting Sir John Hall at the time, you know, and that was it. He was at his arm round him and it was joking with him and having a crack with him, just as he would be with, the, you know, anyone off the street. You know, it didn't matter who it was. He just treated everyone the same. And that was with a real kindred spirit and, and soul and hilarity and, and smile on his face. Uh, yeah. Just an amazing man. No, I, I agree completely. I I met him once by sheer accident like there, it was not planned and I don't think I'd actually have it any other way like looking back now just mm. basically, basically I can't remember what game it was it was at Murray Field my dad went to the toilet the game already started and I kept like because I sit right next to the steps so I kept turning around like god it's like my dad's taking forever and I turn around and you just see this big mountain of tartan yeah. and I'm just like yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah. and he was like you're right, young man. I'm like, um, yeah. I was like, you're Doddy Weir. He's like, I am. Last time I checked, and that, yeah, just some something so natural like that. And then he smiled, gave me a wave, said, "Enjoy the game," and gone. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, the lovely thing about it is, you know, that statement about you never want to meet your heroes sometimes. Yeah. But oh, yeah, Doddy, Doddy, every time of the day, any time of the day, uh, you could meet him, and he'd be exactly the same. And uh, and you, you savour every moment with him. So uh, oh, yeah. it's just how he was. So the, the kind of heroes, you know, you knew that if you ever, anyone had met the man, he'd be how he, they pictured him. So yeah, oh, that's yeah. how it was. I think this, this show has taught me that you, you can definitely meet your heroes. Okay, well, I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad, I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, you were, you were a, a, name, a household name in my, in my house growing up, yeah. My dad taught me a lot about the Underwood brothers, not just Rory or Tony, it was both of them. And then obviously I started watching and then studied almost studying the game myself. And yeah, you yeah, big name. Oh well, thank you. Well, I know I was more talking about every regular rugby play you've had on the podcast. I'm still in the forming ground, so we've got to see out the rest of the show and make sure you have no, you, you're as well. you, you, you've agreed. That's <laughs> like, you, you, you've ticked all the boxes so far. You've, no, well, thanks to your father as well. Thank you for talking about me. That's there very you go. kind. <laughs> I'm, with the, I'm guessing he's from north of the border as well. He's Scottish as well. Yeah, he's same area from where I'm from as well. So oh, there you go. Five area as well. Okay, so well, <laughs> you know, especially when the Scots people are talking positively about you, you can, you're going to take that. So thank you very there much. You <laughs> especially in the 90s as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask you about another legend of the game. But why did you wink at John Oloma ahead of that game? <laughs> 
you can't talk to the man. So you got to you got to accept the harker in some way. So it was a nod of the head and a wink. So I played against Inga Twigamala in my previous uh, appearances against New Zealand. So he'd always accepted it in a nice way. So, uh, um, uh, so yeah. So and uh, but uh, no, that was all that was about. Was just you, you know you love that aspect of the game. The harker was something I used to love to face because it was part of what the game was all about and uh, that that privilege to be facing the All Blacks. You know they are the best in the the game and you know you always look up to them as sort of being the who represent the best in the game uh, and that legacy that they have attached to them so to, to face it and I have that opportunity to face it and you know why they're you know they're laying down the challenge so I can't go up to him and sh shake his hand and say yeah looking forward to it and yeah I accept the challenge sort of thing so you just sort of uh, uh, I, I, it wasn't the wink it was more what I think from what I hear what they were feeding him with during the week uh, about things that I was supposed to have said uh, to wind him up, basically. So, um, oh, God. And, and obviously, you know, how he how he interpreted the challenge acceptance was, you know, yeah, how he did. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, I thought I've obviously everyone has seen that clip, that infamous clip, so many times, where Jonah just runs riot essentially. I can't see who's actually like I don't. There's no one to point the blame at. It's just Jonah is Jonah, essentially, and nobody was. I don't think any team was going to stop him on that day. Just unfortunately, it was used. Well, <laughs> well, any team on that day, but just how how the game went as well. It was. I mean, I I look back because you know that footage, if you like, shown of his first try. You so it gets played back at you plenty of times, but if you wind back just prior to his first try, the uh, well, no, on the try, sorry, the ball came out and the ball actually was passed over his head. Mm. And uh, if it had gone into hand, I was actually there because I was, you know, game plan just close the gap, close the space. If he's had got any space, I don't stand a chance, really. He's so quick, and he, and he if you don't. If you're not on him, he's just always going to have a bit of space and his strength, obviously, is you know, strength all over his body. But we're, we're just, you know, have you, you know, you, you know, the, the percentages aren't great. So you just need to be on him to not so much tackle him, but just be in the way, be a roadblock and just slow him down slightly. So so the reinforcements could arrive. Um, so anyway, I was there uh, on that chance, but the ball went over his head. And so, oh, God. So we had a both you know, sort of readjust and he turned around, then he's in space uh, where I didn't want him. Uh, and um, and the rest of the game kind of played out that way. There was so much loose ball that went the All Blacks way uh, that any team's going to take advantage of turnover ball, loose play sort of thing. But, you know, when you add Jonah into the equation, you know, um, then, 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 yeah, the team's, the, the way the game went, the team obviously sort of played into their hands, if you like, with the looseness of it. Yeah. No, that's fair. I agree with that. Because obviously it was a sight to be holding up. It's still talked about today. But again, like you said, it was very loose. It wasn't it wasn't the cleanest of games. No, I mean it was a great game to watch for the for the vice for the for the you know it was we I don't know whether anyone knew this, but we won the sec we won the second half. I think Rory scored a try, Will scored a great try. Um, um um, I'm, I'm sure there are a couple of others that I miss out, but uh, we actually won the second half. So, yeah. um, um, but yeah, the first half was just uh, so loose. Um, and so, you know, but having said all that stuff, listen, I'm the number 14 against his number 11. Yeah. It's my job. Uh, and so, you know, that, that's, that, that's on my shoulders as much as the team's shoulders, uh, but especially my shoulders that the, the game went the way it did not and we didn't do a better job. I wouldn't. I wouldn't blame just yourself. Don't worry. I, I wouldn't. No, thank you. But uh, you know that that's you know I've got to. I've, you've got to uh, take take it on board when you move forward, and that's what I had to do. Um, yeah. Sort of part of sort of moving forward from it. You know how? What? Why was it? I thought. How can I be better? And how can I move on? And uh, take your part in this. And it was a big part because, as I said, I'm the man opposite him. No, I felt like a boy, I felt like a boy opposite him, but you know. <laughs>
<laughs> I love how honest you are about it, though. I love that. Well, you know, it's it's um, it's part of the learning process. You got to you got to sort of um, take on board. You know, you know. I think most most teams are and most players within it. It's exactly the same. It's you know, what could the team have done the better? But what what could I have done better? And that's how you improve. And you've got to have that challenge mindset moving forward to. To, to be better at what who you are and what you can do in every aspect of life, you know. So, I mean, you could all like the way your career went after this. You could almost say it was a blessing in disguise because you went on to win the Lions series in '97, and then the Premiership in '98 with Newcastle. So, there you go. And obviously, going into that game, you were Grand Slam winners. So, if you were to only keep one. Which one would you keep? Your 95 Grand Slam with England, your 97 Lions Tour victory, or your Newcastle Premiership? If you keep one, the other two disappear and never happen. <laughs> um, it's an, it, uh, uh, the answer was in my head straight away, but I guess uh, in terms of the, uh, the Falcons. Hmm. Um, and I guess it's because um, the, well, without getting too philosophical and too deep, but the question sort of leads on to that is a sense of just to to me, it's not necessarily the the result that you see at the end of it, but what that what that results into what that represents in terms of the journey. Yeah. So the the fact is, with the Lions, that's only eight weeks together with this bunch. The England sort of thing was with that group, was that season, but maybe a little bit earlier as well, with that group. With but not but but where you're coming together every now and then. Yeah. The Falcons one, you, you're literally living and breathing it on a day day by day basis with these guys. Um, um, so and and also. And it, and, it, and obviously we won the championship, but that you got to predate that with. This was a, I mean, it was a royal. I say royal the Rovers nowadays. People don't know what I mean. I think, but do you know what I mean? No, it, it was a, it was a sort of rags to riches sort of story, but not without the, with not not with terms of the monetary side of things, but more the the story of where we came from to where we ended up. So th this, you know, it was the beginning of professionalism. No one knew that it was going to succeed. We were all brought together by Sir John Hall's sort of income, Rob, Dean Ryan and Steve Bates putting together this bunch, Steve Black being very much the instrumental sort of force behind this coming together. We went from the bottom of the second division, sort of consolidated that first season. Next season won the league. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, came second to um, Richmond in the second division to get promoted to the first division, as it was then. Um, or it might have been called the Premiership, I don't know. Uh, and then... Um, uh, and then won it at the first go, uh, being having been promoted. So it was an unbelievable story, but more, as I said, the journey of living and breathing with these guys on a day-by-day -day basis. You know, so you go off and do the Lions thing, you go off and do the England thing, but you're always coming back to this group yeah. uh, and this bond that you have a chance to form. Uh, so they're all very, very special. And I don't want to, so hopefully it doesn't belittle Getting a Lions no, no, series, not win. Not all, not all. it doesn't belittle getting a Grand Slam win, but it's just the necessity of uh, this this bond that you form with people that you're living day by day with, you know. No, I get that, and I love how you you've answered that because some players would just answer, "Oh, I'd have the Premiership," that was, and then like not explain. So yeah. you've you've explained yeah. it very well, and I love your answer, and I love your logic as well because. I've never actually thought of it like that because obviously a lot of players would say like the Lions or the Grand Slam because it's I've always thought if you do well at grassroots you get a club if you do well at a club international if you do well at international you become a Lion but you've made the, the club the most important part and realistically it is at the end of the day that's the one that you have week in week out well, I, I don't want to say it's the most important part we all aspire to be wearing that red jersey of yours, as I said. You know, that's what we all aspire to do. And I'm blessed to have done that and have privileged to have done that. Um, it, it's more, I think the lesson that I want to sort of impart upon it is in, in all aspects of life, it's the journey. 
we all sort of have these goals and aspirations and we all get, you know, sometimes we get there, sometimes we don't. What we got to treasure is the journey to get there and, and, and try and do that. So, yeah. No, I love that. I, love that. I, could, I could listen to you, your philosophy all day and your mindset all day. I love it. No, thank you. <clears throat> so you played with and played against legends of the game. And you, and you said at the start that you were always a winger. <clears throat> Who is your dream back three? So you've got past and present. So we'll have Tony Underwood on one wing. Who's your fullback from the past and your right wing from the past? And who from the modern day would you like to have played with? Um, so I suppose the controversy, I'd say Inga, Guigamala. Yeah. And I'd put him over Jonah. I suppose there's controversy. Oh, I love the controversy though. And, and, and over Rory, I suppose. But I can't <laughs> pick my brother. You can't put a family guy there. So I'd go with Inga. Mm -hmm. And fullback wise, my dream one. Yeah. Ooh. Well, you'd probably have to say Campo, David Campisi. Friend of the show, David Campisi. Against. Sorry? Friend of the show, David Campisi. <laughs> oh, is he good for me? I mean, there were so many good... I mean, Andre Hubert, I, I got a chance to play with that man, just a Rolls-Royce. Uh, you know... My mates, the, the Ian Hunters and Tim Stimpsons of the world that I played with for a lot, you know, coming through age groups and stuff and, and played club stuff. You know, Mike Cat, you know, I, I, sorry, I don't, but I sort of have to, I want to, I want to go for players that I would have loved to have played with, uh, with, and I don't, right. never got a chance to play with Campo. Obviously got a chance to play with Inga. Um, so, so yeah, go for them. Who plays now? Yeah. Ooh. So again, you're you're playing the full eighty again. You're on the you're on the wing, and then you can pick a modern fullback and a modern wing. Yeah, you know, there's going to be too much of a pause in this because I, I, I I think I told you before we spoke. I don't watch that much of it, so um, so I haven't seen e enough of you know, watched enough to really sort of make too much of a comment on it. But um, um, so, uh, so I, I'm not going to go there because I just haven't seen enough of the, okay. the current game. Is that all right? Sorry, I don't want to avoid the question okay. too much. But, uh, uh, not enough to really, to, to compare players against each other as much yeah. as anything. But probably Cheslin Colby, love watching Cost. him. Yeah, uh, love watching. Um, um, oh, oh, sorry, names will escape me now, but sorry, yeah, so I won't, I won't go there. Okay, so okay. Cheslin Colby obviously stands out, and, uh, yeah, no, that's fair. You could, I mean, you could pick another two from, from the past if you want, just because you are our guest. And no, so uh, well, I've named quite a few already, but uh, um, love to have played with Jason Robinson, mm. uh, and um. Yeah, so the, 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 no, only that was the name springing on my, uh, you know, that, that I just missed the cusp of. So he was, he came in the squad just after I was involved. So, uh, yeah. so probably, yeah, to involve with Jeff. But mind you, if he was in the same squad with him, I wouldn't have standed a chance against the guys who came then. So, so, uh, so I'm glad I was in the area era I was where I, had, I was able to play. But um, um. that's fair. That's fair. I mean, all I'm saying is the Underwoods and Jason Robinson as a back three would be absolutely terrifying. Yeah, I'd like to think so, but uh, yeah. This day and age, you know, they're expected to be sort of uh, a lot better, you know, well, Jason, when unbelievable. Our height might have given us away a little bit because this day and age with the aerial ping pong, but Jason was so bloody good under the high ball anyway, even, you know, so, um, so yeah, anyway. That's all good. Um, what made you want to get into becoming a pilot? Because I read about that you, you're now a pilot as well, or were a pilot. Yeah, so um, 
well, essentially, like most rugby players anyway, they don't, well, <laughs> get played pretty well these days. We had to think about what came next, bearing in mind that rugby became professional when I was 26. So yeah. I actually straddled it pretty much equal, a bit more time in the amateur days than I did in the, in the professional days. But um, so you kind of had to think about what next anyway. So I had the, um, had the privilege of um, um, being able to have that time there, but it didn't mean that you kind of had to think about what next. So mm. for me, it was quite a practical thing. <laughs> Literally at Newcastle Falcons, we, had, we were quite close to the airport. So uh, when people are doing their flying training, or, or just uh, to, to learn, you know, literally the first flights in these little airplanes, and we used to do, they used to have to do circuits, which is basically take off, do a little uh, circuit pattern, come in, land, and do a, what's called a touch and go, land, take off, land, take off, and you do these circuit patterns. So, mm -hmm. and, and, and where, it, where the other end, end of the race course pattern, if you like, was right over Newcastle Falcons training ground. So sometimes when you're a little bit bored, I have to admit, you know, sometimes you just sat there and thinking, this thing passing over my head quite a few times. And that, that you know, it was in my head about what next. And um, it just sort of triggered the thought at that stage. So thought about it, thought yes, dragged Inga up to um, to uh, Newcastle Aero Club with me. Uh, I did a few couple of lessons and took him up, Marius Herter, you know, uh, my prop up there. So big lads, used to take them up flying every now and then, but they started doing a bit as well. But I just kept it going. And um, that's how it all started. Uh, translating that into, you know, perhaps that's the way to go. Fair enough. Yeah, I like that. Do you, do you still fly today or? No, my career finished uh, coming up to three years ago. So uh, just got affected by COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. I was uh, flying out in Dubai for Emirates and um, flying 380s around. Uh, COVID hit. They, they, they grounded pretty much most of the fleet. I think we went from about a 120 of our fleet in the skies to about five. So um, it didn't deal with it the best way possible. So made most of us redundant. Uh, yeah. and, we're, and then within a few months, we're sending emails out saying, we'd like you to come back. Uh, and basically decided, uh, you know, that's it. Didn't want to go back flying again. That's fair. That's understandable. I, I could get why. I know. Yeah. No, no. yeah. So. Who knows? So, so what's next for, for Tony Underwood? So post-flying, I've been uh, developing, trying to pass on some of the experiences that I've gained from either being at the top of rugby or flying 380s around the world about very these very different perspectives about what it takes to create a team together. And um, so pa pass that forward in terms of how I help organisations in developing their their leaders, their teams, about how they develop uh, in terms of what I would call trust-centered trust leadership, um, about how that translates into how you can get the best out of a team. Love that. Should, you should do TED Talks. <laughs> anyway, just, I just how, you, just how you speak. I could just get you in front of a big conference room. You could talk about your rugby, you could talk about airline, you could talk about the two. Yeah, well, that's very kind. Very kind of you. Go for it. Yeah, hour and a half at a time. Mm -hmm. Different conferences around the world. Yeah, go for it. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, well, thank you very much. We'll see. How, we'll see where this path takes me. So, I love that. We're going to go into something a bit different now. So we're going to get to know you as a person. Ooh, okay. So, cats or dogs? Oh, dogs. Yeah, easy choice. I don't know why I keep that in, but maybe, <laughs> maybe one day somebody will catch me off guard and say cats. Well, we speak to Rory, he has loads of cats, so uh, he probably say ah, cats. There we go, there we go. That's that's how you separate the Underwood brothers. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. He might say dogs, but he has, he has a lot of cats. <laughs> see, if you, see if you get him on and he says dogs, I could call him out for him and be like, no. He might give you a different answer, I don't know. We'll wait and see. Rab rabbits is the answer. There you go. <laughs> um, favorite film oh life of brian oh nice good if there was a film on based on your career who would you want to play tony underwood in the film oh 
forget the guy's name, but there was this guy when I was playing who used to play Superman, Dean Kane, I think is that, that something like that. Okay, yeah, yeah. And on, on the right angle, it has to be a particular <laughs> angle. We looked a bit like each other. Um, but the Daily Mail ran something. They, they used to run these things about who looks the same. And they mm -hmm. put me together with him, but it was this footage which did look a bit like him. Anyway, uh, oh, I'd love, um, I couldn't though, because he just doesn't look, well, The Rock. I'd love The Rock. Yeah. Rain Johnson. Yeah, what was that? He could, he could do it. He'd have to, I don't know. Yeah, no, yeah, go for it. Ever, you, you got CGI now, so it could change up. Yeah, well, there's a bit, you know, the, the sort of uh, Samoan sort of look. Doesn't look too dissimilar to the Malaysian sort of bit mm. of me, so I can yeah. really sort of carry that off. <laughs> Plus, he played rugby as well, so there you go. Well, did he? He played NFL. It, no, I think he tried not like professional. I think he's, he had a game of rugby. Oh wow! He, he gave rugby a go. And he said it's the yeah, it's the yeah. hardest thing he's ever played. <laughs> I but, don't know about that, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what would the film be called? <clears throat> Ooh. I've got one that sounds cringy now that, now that I've thought it out. Do you know what? I had one because it was talking about wing. Forgotten what it's called. I have one. It's, 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 I think we're actually on the same lines here, but I had it in my head there and I was like, if I say so, it's going to sound dead cringy. Go but on, from wings to wings. Yeah, it was playing along that. Yeah, see. Uh, see. I mean, Tony just click. I love it. <laughs> Forgotten the name of it. Mate of mine was going to write a book, still thinking about writing it, and it was, uh, oh, yeah. But there, you are, I'll take yours for now. From grounded switching wings, wings. wings, switching wings, switching wings. Oh, I like that. That's cool. There you go. There we go. Love that. What is your favourite style of food or food cuisine? Ooh. Well, I'm a Malaysian boy, so I have to say that. But every time, uh, with the flying, I used to go around lots and lots of countries. But wherever I ended up, I always looked for ramen noodles, chicken chili ramen noodles, so Japanese. Nice. Like that. Sashimi and chicken chili. Sashimi, some uh, gyozo, and um, chicken chili ramen. There you go. Nice. So what's, what's the go-to Malaysian meal for you? Ooh, uh, that would be something called roti chanai, which is this sort of bread, nicely sweet bread. Dip it in either sugar, if you like a sweet tooth or chili or curry sauce. It would be followed by a, um, what would I go for, a laksa. Something called a laksa. It's like a noodly thing with uh, either okay. prawns and noodles and a very nice broth, which it's, it's along the lines of ramen noodles. Uh, and then a bit of a tandoori chicken. There's a, the nice thing about Malaysia, it's got a Chinese influence, Indi Indian influence, Indonesian influence, as well as Malay food. Uh, so the, the is, um, so a concoction of a lot of lovely dishes. And took all the good bits. And, <laughs> and then washed down by some nice fruits and mangoes. So. There you go. Well, that sounds so awful. And very refreshing as well. I like, yeah. like this. <laughs> what is your favourite uh, pizza topping? Uh, it would be just go um, meaty, as much yeah. different types of meat as possible. Start pepperoni, but you need to get as many different types on there as you can. I love that. I'm, I'm and because I was, I did the pizza hat, it has to be a stuffed crust. Oh, yes, 100%. I'm all for this. <laughs> does pineapple belong on pizza? No. Uh, well, no, does it belong on pizza? I don't mind it, it's fine. Sorry, but I don't necessarily go for it. Oh, you were doing well there until you said that. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is your favourite um, social drink? I usually say post-match drink, so like you and the boys have had a big win, you're out in the town, what are you drinking? Well, I'm a teetotaler, so it's Coca-Cola yeah. before or after. <laughs> so, Fair enough. Um, having said that, I was about to say if I, I've got a sweet tooth, so, you know, those sort of um, shots that yeah. you can have with like some sweet stuff in it, like, something like that. Fair enough. So I am partial to, after a Japanese food, a nice bit of warm sake. What is sake? I've heard about it, but what is it? It's rice wine. 
it's rice. wine made from rice rather than grapes, basically. But it's, uh, yeah. I'm intrigued. That's what actually got me intrigued now. I'm, Go and have some. It's delicious. I'm not a big wine person, but... No, no, no. It's just, it's not, it's a small drink, warmed. It's like little small cups that just take little sips out of them. Have a okay. go. Go for enough. the Japanese. Have the meal I just told you. Okay. Yeah. Sashimi. Uh, have the um, have the gyoza, and uh, and then um, and in fact, uh, yeah, and have a have a ramen, and then have a have a ramen noodles, and have a sa hot, hot sake afterwards. Only if you're coming with me, though. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. I'm sure they got some up in Fife. Well, for, well, yeah. Well, it doesn't have to be in Fife. I'll we could arrange, I could drive, it's all good. Meet you halfway. I don't know if there's going to be in the borders either. <laughs> there's got to be something somewhere that we could eat. Yeah, yeah. Um, Favourite, or what do you recommend to binge watch on television at the moment? Ooh. Well, we re-watched Game of Thrones recently, so you can't watch that again. What did we binge watch recently? Oh, um... Loved, oh my god, I've forgotten the name of it. Um, can I shout out to my wife? Yeah, of course. Honey, what was this TV series we watched? Oh, Shit, Shit's Creek. Shit's Creek, yeah, yeah. Oh, well answered. <laughs> Shit's Creek. <laughs> Controversially, I've never watched an episode of Game of Thrones. Okay, no worries. It's, it's a uh, it's a, yeah, I can understand why. It took, I didn't watch it when it first came out. We watched it again a bit later on, but yeah. No, my my partner watched it right through. So when we got together, it was like the, near the end of the show. Yeah. And she's watching it, and I'm looking like, oh, rubbish. Yeah, yeah. She's like, yeah, but you don't understand. That. I'm like, I don't want to. Uh, uh, just... Yeah, no, you've got to watch it from the beginning, follow the plot lines and, and through it. No, it should do... be uh, Brooklyn Nine-Niner as well. Yes. I kind of hear that. I love that. I do recommend Vikings, though. It's on uh, Prime. Okay. Thank it's you. Fantastic. Give it a go. And if you're not too offended by like, the goriness, then... Well, no, it'd be Games of Thrones is like that, so yeah. Well, yeah, true, yeah. Fair point, yeah. <laughs> um, do you have any tattoos? No. Would you ever have a tattoo? I would. Um, it's a sad thing, but unfortunately, Inga passed away. It was always the sort of deal I had with him that when I came to see him out in New Zealand, and I did thankfully see him a few years before, a couple of years ago before he passed, or four, mm. four, four years ago, um, but it was to go and have a, a Maori one, and um, basically uh, that kind of style of, um, what do they call it, band? Yeah, yeah. My youngest wants me to have a have a whole sleeve, but I don't think I'm going to go that way. Half sleeve, because you can still wear a polo shirt. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, but no, I don't have a I don't have a tattoo. Fair enough. The, the only reason I ask is because I've got tattoos and I always like to compare. Where you get? Okay, no, sorry, I can't help you. No, it's all good. <laughs> don't worry about it. What is your favorite song or style of music? Um. Uh, Ooh, so can I say song? But I mean, I'm a Coldplay, probably not massively into music. I'm not a music guy. Mm. Uh, but if I put anything on it, it'd be that. My go-to is on a Friday, and it's um, the Cure, and it's uh, God. I can't forget, forget the name of it. It's about Fridays. Oh, fr Friday, I'm in love. Friday, I'm in love. Thank you. Yeah, there you go. Good. Blast song. that out. Blast that out on a Friday. Whether you're in love or not, hopefully you are. It's easier if you are. Okay. It is easier if you are, but <laughs> even if you're not, blast out the song. <laughs> Where is your dream holiday destination? You and the family, two weeks. Uh, ooh. See, yeah, I'll be splitting the family apart. You have to have a combo holiday. Um, okay. Listen, uh, probably a, a mix of Italy, because mm. uh, I want to say I want to say Malaysia because of that, but I, I, I'm not. But I, I need a bit of uh, I need a bit of um, sort of nice green, but not jungle tropic scenery. 
So it'd be yeah, a no, mix. Yeah, but sort of Italy, sort of up near the north, near Lake Como type of thing, uh, and mountainous sort of area mixed with a um, bit of tropics. Mal I got you got to send you to Malaysia because I've got to promote my country. Of course. Uh, mixed with you got to dip into a bit of my family won't, uh, especially two of them won't. My wife and my youngest um, will want to be in Orlando at some stage. They just love the theme parks. Fair enough. And the retail and the outlets. So, yeah. Okay, I need to try and cover all that. I don't know where you get all that. Yeah, it's all right when you work in the airlines. You can kind of get around those places reasonably easily. But uh, otherwise, you know. Yeah, no, that's, that's very true. I think I'd, I'd love to go to Fiji, but it's far too expensive. Actually, do you know what? I'm going to backtrack all of that and just talk about no amount of family. My wife would be the same. They'd probably be all right, the, the, the two kids. Uh, Japan. Japan. Nicest holiday ever had in the world. I've just, uh, it just seems like a whole different world. It, and that's why it is so, yeah. it's so different to anyone, anything else you'll ever see. Uh, scenery, people, the food, the culture, everything. Yeah. Not Maybe not the food. I'm not a big, I don't like sushi. I don't like it. I told I gave you a few other dishes to try. I know you did. Yeah, she did. Yeah. Just very I'll just stick with the Underwood menu. Yeah. <laughs> Skip the sashimi and have the uh, the gyoza and the ramen noodles. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, we're fine. I'll have to eat it with a fork though, because chopsticks in me. Yeah, don't. I will they'll forgive you. I'll just spoon it in. Just, yeah, bowl it. Yeah, that's what that works. Just tip it in, that's all right. That works for me. <laughs> Final question for you today. One thing you'd like to be remembered for. Oh, um, one thing I'd like to be remembered for. He made me feel good. Yeah, no, I like that. That's good. You've you made me smile this whole time, so there you go. Well, whatever the feeling is, if feeling good is, if it's uh, you know, invariably a smile, hopefully, but just you feel good about yourself. You feel good. Yeah. Having met me, so. Not because I, of me, yeah. but because of, you know, I've, I've made you feel no, good. I get it. Yeah, no, I understand. And I can vouch. You, you make me feel good because I've met you. So there you go. Ah. Well, thank you. There you go. Well, the book is now closed, Tony, because okay. you've, <laughs> absolutely, you've absolutely smashed it. And I cannot thank you enough for agreeing to come on. Very absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure yeah. to talk about this stuff. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks for dragging the shirts out. Sorry I had to bring my Newcastle no because, he, because he couldn't find it, but uh, thank you for representing my past there on the... On the That's all good. I'll, I'll, it's all something them, I enjoy. One of them special yeah. memories, so thank you very much. Good. I'm glad I could make you happy as well. So, happy sure. days. You you being happy makes me happy, so that makes, means I'm doing my job. Well, we're, in, we're in kindred spirits about that then. Thanks, Mary. Absolutely. Well, this has been the final whistle with Tony Underwood, and we'll see you next time.